Today on Inside California Politics, COVID-19 deals a massive blow to the state's budget. We recognize these cuts are devastating to so many people. Where the money is going this year and grading the governor. This is when leadership is put to the test. This is when you can see what you can do, and what you can accomplish, and how to say no to people. That's a very difficult thing to do in politics. Two men who've made a career of advising lawmakers weigh in on Newsom's performance. At some point, it starts to sound a little bit like word salad. And she's made headlines for what she tweeted at Tesla's Elon Musk. It was my personal Twitter, and I, I said what I felt. Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez is here to talk about why she's not backing down. A Fox 40 contributor and Lincoln Project founder Mike Madrid is here to talk about his Republican super PAC that's taking aim at President Trump. What do you say to people who see you as a traitor to the party? I say you're a traitor to the cause. Today, May 17th on Inside California Politics. Hi, everyone. I'm Nikki Lorenzo, and welcome to Inside California Politics. Troubling, unprecedented, and historical. Just some of the words that Governor Newsom used to describe his revised budget plan for the state reporting unemployment numbers that haven't been seen since the Great Depression. The $203 billion proposal includes a $5 billion cut to K-12 through public schools. It would slash some Medi-Cal services. State employees would receive a 10% pay cut, and state parks would see a $30 million deficit starting next year. Joining me now to discuss the budget cuts and much more, we have Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez of San Diego joining us now. Assemblywoman Gonzalez, thank you so much for joining us this morning on Inside California Politics. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Okay, so these are tough times for the state. The governor hasn't minced words about this. I know this is going to be a tall order for you to decide what to, to, decide what to cut here. So just starting off, it looks like there's going to be a cut to workers' pay. This is something that you're passionate about. I am. I, and on the one hand, the governor has been clear that he's not going to um, stall the increases in minimum wage over the next year, which is really important. Um, there's no, there's a possibility for an off ramp and he's saying, no, we're going to continue to increase the minimum wage that, that touches so many workers lives, especially so many of those workers who are on the front lines right now working in our grocery stores and delivery drivers. So I think that's really important. On the other hand, um, he's talking about across the board cuts for, for state workers. And I, I just want to make sure that we're looking at it in a more nuanced way. Our uh, lowest paid civil servants were having a hard time making ends meet before the pandemic. And so I want to make sure that maybe we have a more um, progressive, less regressive way of cutting across the board and that if we have to make cuts, it's a last resort. Um, it, it's not like anybody's getting rich off public service right now and and taking that cut can really uh, put somebody into, into harm's way if they've just been basically making rent and putting food on the table. We don't want them in a position where they can no longer do that. All right. So this is this the only resort, though? You know, I, I don't know. And, and so we're still looking through um, his approach to, to the budget. And of course, we're going to have some say in it as well as it goes through the legislative process. So I do agree that we have to, you know, refine and cut um, the, the state work in general. And it's not necessarily from workers, but, you know, how much we're traveling and, and the cars we're using, things like that. That's a good way to start. Um, but we'll have to see. We're going to have to take a really close look at what are some of the other possibilities before we make some kind of blanket cuts. I, I want to ask you about federal aid. The governor said that, look, we're going to need help from the federal government. It seems like there's a lot of reliance on that since we're not going to use the rainy day fund all at once. It looks like it's going to be the way the governor's proposed it over the next three years. Are you confident that we can rely on the federal government and put all our eggs in that basket because the federal government is going to be handling requests from states all across the country? Yeah, but you know, we, we, we pay into the federal government um, more than our share. And so I, I think this is a time that we're very lucky to have um, Nancy Pelosi at the helm of, the, of, of Congress who, who is looking out for her home state as they're negotiating for all the states. And I think we're gonna have to have um, some federal help along with um, every state in this nation. And so that's something that we're gonna look at and look to in order that we don't have to cut as drastically as um, we otherwise would. And I appreciate the optimism, but is that really realistic? 
it is. It's the federal government is the only uh, government that can actually operate a deficit. And I think we're in really tough times. And the president knows that. I mean, we can have disagreements about some of his policy, but he knows we're in tough times. And it doesn't help the stock market when um, cities and, and counties and states are, are going bankrupt. You know, we've been really fair about how we've squirreled away money for a rainy day. Um, but we're going to have years of a rainy day. And we're trying to be responsible about how we're using that fund as well. So this I think is going to have to be an option. Um, we're looking to the federal government for help. And I, I really hope as a country um, that they respond. Okay, I want to pivot now to the debate and battle with Elon Musk over Tesla. So there was some tension over the past week and attention on social media. And I know the media likes to look at the language, you know, the four letter word that was used in response to Elon Musk. But I want to talk about the frustration from you behind that why were you so upset at elon musk and him wanting to open up te uh, tesla and then we can talk about the difference between small businesses and large businesses well it wasn't just him wanting to open up it was that he was basically saying and what he has been saying over the course of you know the last few months that this isn't real it's not a real threat he didn't shut down when he was supposed to shut down um he's basically saying i'm going to operate outside the law and then i'm going to pick up my marbles and go home go somewhere else uh, in knowing that we have been funding um, Tesla and Solar City and SpaceX, all his companies, um, for a number of years, I've been in the legislature, I think, six years, and, and they've gotten over $5 billion of tax subsidies. So to hear um, how much of, uh, uh, of, a, of a fit he was throwing and saying he wasn't going to abide by the law and he would just leave the state after all we've done to partner with him, I was really reacting, I think, as a regular person, not in a legislative manner. It was my personal Twitter. And I, I said what I felt, um, you know, it, it gets frustrating when we see um, billionaires thinking that they can uh, go by a different set of rules than everybody else. And, and so I knew that the County of Alameda had been working with him um, in order to get to a place where they could reopen, that it might take another week. And yet he was throwing this kind of fit over a week. Do you think the governor caved, though? Because it seemed like when you had, we had some smaller communities here in Northern California uh, that were saying, hey, we're going to reopen and defy the stay at home orders. And there was a threat to pull disaster aid funding. But it seems kind of like Elon Musk said, you know, we are, we're reopening. And the governor's like, well, you know, I need to look at it. I don't really know what's happening and kind of punted it to Alameda County. Well, the governor had said from day one, you know, these are the guidelines and, and, and this is what the state is going to do. And counties are empowered to, to operate a little slower than that, given the situation of the county. So he does believe in local control to a certain extent. And I think he was trying to exercise that. And I think the county of Alameda was trying to use the best science, the best um, public health advice in order to ensure that a large manufacturing plant operated safely and opened up safely for the workers. It's just a shame um, that we live in a society I guess where if you have enough money and if you're um, you know rich and powerful enough that you can simply tell the government no I'm gonna do things my own way I think that's dangerous it's dangerous for all of us it's dangerous for us as a society and it's wrong for our mom-and-pop businesses that are doing everything and playing by the rules okay so you say so you don't have two personas and a lot of criticism about politicians is they're not authentic so speaking to that would you do it again uh, yeah, I mean, I, literally, this is what happened. My kids were watching, they, they're on this, during this pandemic, they're watching every Star Wars in chronological order. So the prequels are on the prequels. And I've seen them all. I'm not that interested in watching them again, but I sit out with them when they're watching it. I'm <laughs> going through Twitter and I'm um, seeing kind of story after the story after story of Elon Musk um, saying these atrocious things and, and just throwing a temper tantrum. And then also knowing that his history of union busting and having an unsafe working conditions and the history of California funding this company with public subsidies and taxpayer subsidies. Yeah, I'm going to react the way I'm going to react. And so um, I'm sorry if my language offended anyone. I really am. I, I, I don't like to, to offend people, but I am who I am on my personal Twitter. Um, I'm going to continue to be. And, uh, you know, most of the time I, I I, I don't throw out the F word. And by the way, I used an asterisk, so I was not. I was, <laughs> you it, censored yourself a bit. Yeah. <laughs> PG-13. Um, I don't know if that's PG-13. But, you know, I, I, I was I was just expressing the outrage I think a lot of us feel on the disparities um, that we have in the state and in this country when we're dealing with uh, individual people and individual companies. And um, it should be more fair. 
Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez, we thank you so much for your time this morning on Inside California Politics. We hope to have you back soon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. As officials work to keep the public informed about the coronavirus, we are learning more about how people feel about those leaders, specifically the governor. So a new poll from Fox 40's parent company, the Next Star Media Group and Emerson College shows almost 65% of registered voters approve of the job that Governor Newsom is doing. 20% disapprove and a little over 15% are neutral on this topic. So to discuss the governor's performance and just managing a crisis from a communication standpoint, I want to bring in our experts now, Rob Stutzman, communications director for Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger and Steve Maviglio, press secretary for Governor Gray Davis. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here on Inside California Politics. We appreciate it. Thanks, Nick. Good to be here. Okay, so Rob, I want to start with you since you're the Republican here because you have been following this crisis and Governor Newsom's performance very closely. I follow your comments on Twitter. Some of our viewers might not. So I just want to get to your stance on how Governor Newsom's doing so far. So if there is some criticism and some recommendations, people just don't think, oh, he's a Republican criticizing a Democratic governor. No, that, I, I have uh, given the governor high marks, in fact, uh, a real A. If you go back to the very beginning of this crisis, when he had to start communicating something that is uh, antithetical to American society, which is to stay home and restrict movement and liberty. Uh, he was very clear. Uh, he was very uh, optimistic and hopeful. He was cheering us on towards solutions while delivering you know, concise uh, medical information, public health information. And I thought his, you know, his encouragement of using carrot as opposed to stick, uh, I think was very effective in getting people to comply and want to participate in what we had to do as a society. Now, as time goes on, we're hitting a new phase and there's difficult tension of when to continue on a heavy public health message as opposed to switching to some of an economic restart message. And I think he's finding his way through that. But uh, look, overall, I think he's, he's done a, a very good job and deserves those high approval ratings that Californians are giving. Steve, I want to ask you, in your former role as press secretary, you know, each of you dealt with crisis during your time serving in your positions. Talk about messaging and how important it is to communicate with the public in a very clear way so you don't lose the public. Well, one of the things Governor Newsom has working for him that we didn't have really in our day was the use of social media. I mean, he's deploying it at every level. He's on every day at 12 noon live. Um, he's using Twitter, he's using Facebook, he's using all the social media platforms in addition to conventional media to get his message out. And that's a huge, enormous advantage. He doesn't have the filter of a lot of media that Rob and I used to have to deal with. And in a crisis, you know, you're leveraging every department of government you can to be coordinated. And I think he's done an excellent job doing that. You see him flanked by people that get high recognition from Californians who have come to the stage with a lot of weight and doctor and director and all those things that give real confidence to the things that he's saying. And it's all backed up with data. And I think the way his approach to doing that is just focusing like a laser beam on data and expertise which is a lot different than we're seeing out of Washington, D.C. I think that's what's really given him high marks. Rob, do you think, though, that you mentioned this a little bit in your first remarks, that the public can be can get a little bit restless each day? You know, we are having these press conferences and some of them are they seem to have a tone of maybe an announcement about a non announcement or, hey, we're going to do this. Wait for this announcement in a couple of days. Do you think that that is a bit risky? Yeah, I think we've entered a phase here in, tr in the governor trying to explain reopening where if, you know, everyday Californians were to tune in at noon, they're not necessarily hearing anything that's clear that really relates to their lives, not real sure what some of what he's saying may mean. This be so it's becoming a little bit muddled, but it, it's not just messaging. The reality is there's a very muddled tension we've seen going on this past week between counties and the state and trying to figure out how to reopen a bit and what that may mean and what it means, you know, particularly for businesses, particularly in the restaurant space. So, yeah, I, you know, one thing the governor does is he uses big words, yes. doesn't necessarily talk the way like normal people talk. And sometimes I think that could make him a little less relatable. But on the other hand, I think it also gives him a, a bit of an air of authority 
but at some point it starts to sound a little bit like word salad unless you can really tell people what they want to know which is well can i go back to a restaurant can i go back to my job are my kids going to go back to school and what is that going to look like and you know as soon as those answers exist they should get communicated um but i think he's i think he's struggling a little bit in the last week or so to do that effectively Steve, if you could give some advice, if you were in this role, what would you say to Governor Newsom? What would you do differently? You know, not much, to be honest with you. I think what's striking here is the difference from what you're seeing at the state level than you're seeing at the federal level. And general confusion, as Rob notes, among the public, because they're getting very different messages from all different layers of government. Uh, the feds are saying one thing, county government's saying one thing, it's like, who do you believe? And I think he's really commanded authority and shown real leadership by doing and taking direct actions almost every day, something different, something new. Um, in the last 24 hours, it's been wildfire, something people really haven't talked about before, but he's able to command the stage on that subject because he's announced a lot of different initiatives uh, in terms of buying masks from China or other things like that, that he's really showing leadership. So, um, you know, he needs to keep on doing what he's doing. Then now's the hard part. Now we have to figure out how to pay for all this, how to restart the state economy. And there are a lot of knives that are gonna come out when that happens, because a lot of different oxes are being gored right now. And everybody has their hand out and there's just not enough to go around. Yeah, when you look at the budget pie, I just don't know how they're gonna do this, especially with most of our income coming from personal income tax. You don't wanna be working right now. So that's gonna be a tall order for our state government. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being on Inside California Politics. We have to leave it there, but please come back on the show. We look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you. Up next, the ad that caught the president's attention. It's from a small Republican super PAC, and one of its founders is a Fox 40 contributor. We're gonna to speak to Mike Madrid next. With the presidential election just six months away, a small anti-Trump super PAC is ramping up its attacks on the president. The Lincoln Project, founded in part by George Conway, the husband of Kellyanne Conway, who serves as a counselor to President Trump, and Fox 40 political contributor Mike Madrid. So a few weeks ago, they launched a new ad. It's called Morning in America. Take a look. There's morning in America. Today, more than 60,000 Americans have died from a deadly virus Donald Trump ignored. With the economy in shambles, more than 26 million Americans are out of work. The worst economy in decades. Trump bailed out Wall Street, but not Main Street. All right, so that title might sound a little bit familiar to you. It is a play on a famous ad for Ronald Reagan's reelection campaign back in 1984. So since this ad aired on Fox News, the Lincoln Project has raised more than $2.2 million. It also grabbed the attention of President Trump. I saw a project, a uh, thing called the Lincoln Project, and I would have them change the name to the Losers Project because if you take a look at Schmidt, it's, it's uh, George Conway, the guy is... He, Kellyanne must have done a big number on him, but it's George Conway and it's some other people, Weaver. Every one of them I either defeated or, or they lost by themselves. But it's a group of major losers. They're Republican losers. All right, so not the most polite segue, but we have one of those uh, individuals joining us right now, Mike Madrid, as we said, a Fox 40 political contributor. Mike, thanks so much for being with us again on Inside California Politics. We appreciate it. Nikki, it's always great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Okay, so I want to start right there. Did you anticipate this reaction from the president? Because, of course, this aired in a break during Tucker Carlson's show on Fox News. So you had to assume the president was going to see it. Yeah, we, we were targeting him specifically. Our audience on this ad, at least from the rollout, was one person. It was the president. It was designed specifically to elicit this specific reaction. And he took the bait. Um, he's easy to bait. It's simple. Um, he took it and he gave uh, national exposure, not just to the Lincoln Project, but to the message that is working with Republicans and um, obviously incredibly effective. Um, we've got millions of voters engaged now, millions of dollars raised, I think 17, 18 million views on the ad. So, yeah, our audience was one, but we've leveraged it into 18 million. OK, so I want to talk about what's next. So you've raised all of this money. And as I believe, the Lincoln Project has endorsed Joe Biden for president. So do you use that money for more ads like this? Is it to get Joe Biden elect elected? Just talk about the agenda. Sure, this is really important. Uh, while we have elected Joe Biden, the real primary objective here is having Republicans communicate with other Republicans. Keep in mind, 
every one of these members, and there are seven of us that founded this, are either Republicans, I'm a Republican, Republican, people who left the party because they could not tolerate uh, what Donald Trump is doing to our country, let alone to this party. The focus is to communicate with the, with the Republican base, a base that we know as well or better than anybody else, to focus that attention and have them realize that they are not alone, that there are thousands, millions of Republicans who also are frightful of what this president is doing to our country, to our constitution, and now with the COVID-19 situation, to our health. Okay, so let's say you are successful and the president is defeated in November. Joe Biden, who is the presumptive nominee on the Democratic side right now, uh, is elected. What is the strategy? Do you just start from the ground up and try to rebuild the Republican Party? Because there's been some talk here in California to sort of have a new Republican Party. It's a great question. The Republican Party is in chaos at the moment. There is some unanimity against Democrats. But being against something doesn't mean you're for anything. And Trump really exploited these divisions, uh, which had traditionally been characterized as moderate versus conservative. The truth is what we're really dealing with now is conservatives, which I am one of them, all of us in the Lincoln Project are, and nationalists, which our Trump is. We don't believe they're compatible. So my guess is, our hope is, that the defeat of Donald Trump will be so resounding that Republicans will again realize that Trump is an anchor. He's a political liability. Uh, which he has been since he's been elected. The Republican Party has lost numerous seats, lost a majority in the House ever since he's been elected. He's been a disaster. Is to realize that that political liability is no, no longer worth pursuing, and then the potentiality of conservatism coming back and having the Republican Party being a conservative party once again, I think is the hope, and that's the promise and what we're looking towards. All right, so what do you say to people who see you as a traitor to the party? I say you're a traitor to the cause. <laughs> um, I, look, I'm a conservative before I'm a Republican. I don't wear my Republicanness just because I wear a red jersey and somebody else wears a blue jersey. It actually means something to me. I oppose smaller government. I oppose deficit spending. I support free trade. I support uh, a capitalist free market economy. Donald Trump has violated every one of those basic core tenets of conservatism. Everything we know as conservatism over the last 50 years, Donald Trump has trampled on. That's not conservatism. He may be trying to uh, redefine republicanism, but he's gonna have to fight us in order to get there. And I think that the softening of Republican support in most of the recent polls nationwide demonstrate that there's an appetite for Republicans to move back to something that they're more accustomed to. I think Trump fatigue is becoming a real thing. It's a real problem for the president. And it's why he's losing, uh, not just in the national polls, but in all the battleground polls as well. Mike Madrid, we are out of time. Thank you so much for being back on Inside California Politics. And when you have a new ad, I hope you come back and release it here for the first time. We'll do that, Nikki. All I'd right. love to do that. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Up next, we lost a comedic legend last week, Jerry Stiller. When we come back, the world from his perspective. Serenity now! Serenity now! The tradition of Festivus begins with the airing of grievances. I got a lot of problems with you people. Now, you're gonna hear about it. This week, we lost a comedy legend, Jerry Stiller, who played the iconic Frank Costanza in the still widely popular show Seinfeld, died at the age of 92 of natural causes. He was a master of his craft, perfect comedic timing, and seemed to never break character during a scene, even when his fellow actors, they could not spit out a word without erupting in laughter. So watching the tributes pour in all over social media this week, I wondered, what inspired Jerry Stiller to pursue a career that resulted in making so many of us laugh for so many years? This quote from Stiller answers that question. During the Great Depression, when people laughed, their worries disappeared. Audiences loved these funny men. I decided to become one. I think we can all agree the world is weird right now, but maybe as we speak, these trying times are serving as an inspiration that one day will result in something that will make all of our worries disappear. That is our show for this week. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll see you next Sunday right here on Inside California Politics.